right? It's 2 o'clock, so I guess uh, we'll just get started. Is it recording OK? OK, great. So welcome to this presentation about how to write maintainable large-scale software. Um, I'm going to be trying out a couple new things today um, in my way of presenting, so hopefully that won't work well. Before we get started, let me introduce myself. I'm Christian van den Ende. I come from Belgium. You can contact me at these two, or in these two ways, um, but let me be honest with you, I hardly ever check Twitter. I never really checked it in the past. I just mainly use it for conferences and, and to you know, use it as another way to advertise that I have a new release of the group module or something. Um, and I'm the author and maintainer of the group module, uh, among other things. So this is my background for this talk. Usually when I, when I introduce myself, I introduce myself in a way that's relevant to the talk. So that's why there's not a picture of me, but a picture of the logo of the group module here. I've been writing group and other large-scale software for over a decade, and I'm a highly sensitive person. I always tell that, uh, people about my high sensitivity because I might start hyperventilating at random during a session or just random stuff going wrong with my body because my brain just interprets every stimulus way too hard. Um, which is a nice segue to the next part. It's not about the life of a maintainer, this talk. So it's not about what it's like to be a maintainer. It's not about you know, how to interact with people in the issue queue. I've had a presentation about that at DrupalCon Europe 2020, the, the remote one. Um, and we are at Dev Days, so I'm assuming people want to talk code. Um, there is one thing that I do want to mention, and that when you're maintaining this software, the human is the most important part. You're you. If you have any needs, if people are badgering you or whatever, always put yourself first. Right? That's just something I want to get, uh, I want to make clear. Um, and I'm saying let's talk code, but actually we're not go going to be talking code, we're going to be talking software. There's a difference. Code is how you get there. The software is the complete product. What we're going to be talking about today is the architectural decisions that you make when writing your software. So yeah, that's basically what this talk is about. <laughs> so I, uh, I should have pressed on the button. So let's first de define what I think is large-scale software. So large-scale software, in my ID, is large in footprint, not necessarily in user base. Obviously, one usually follows the other. But if you have a use case for maybe only a couple hundred people that requires a lot of you know, software to be written that's very complicated, that interacts with each other on many different levels, that's large-scale. And you'll be wanting to make uh, proper architectural decisions even if you write this software for a couple hundred people. If you're writing it for a couple hundred thousand people, you're definitely going to want to be making proper architectural decisions. You're just going to end up hating yourself if you don't. So the next piece is that it serves a broad amount of use cases. Not necessarily, but often so. What I, like, let's take Drupal, for instance. You can do many things with Drupal, right? So what you want to do is you want to make it so that people who want to do one of these many scenarios with Drupal, they are able to. You don't want to shut them out. So you want to keep in the back of your head that if you, if you wrote this software with one purpose in mind, that when you open source it, that you, have it that you have the possibility to serve many cases. Why else would you open source it? Hey, this is my website. Here's the, so the source for it. Yeah, no one's really served with that. But if you say, I did something cool while building my website, and here's the, that piece of code and how you can use it, that is beneficial to many people. So that's what you want to keep in mind. And then finally, and this is really tiny to read, but it comes with a solid, solid API. So you, if you want to have um, people interact with your code, they need to be able to do that in a way that you specified. If you just dump the code and you're like, yeah, OK, I have a form left and right, and you can alter it or whatever, but you have to do your own thing, that really sucks. You want, to be able, um, you want people to be able to do many things with your code with little effort. And you want it to be clear. You want it for them to be almost instinctive. Like, oh, yeah, OK, I can see by example that he achieved this this way. So if I try it the same way, it should work. And then when they do that, it works. Those are the expectations that you're setting and should be met. So if you're planning on starting, um, to write such large software, and I'm kicking in many open doors at, at the first half of the talk, by the way, that it all starts with an ID, the obviously. But how do you make that ID, or how do you turn that into software? 
Well, first of all, you need to actually, you know, define what your ID is and not just an elevator pitch, but no, you need to have the full details. You need to have the scope. What is part of my ID and what isn't? Even if perhaps it could be an extension, you need to be aware of what is your core of your ID and then you need to communicate that core business well. And before you actually start writing the first line of code, and this is Rich coming from the guy who basically reinvented organic groups, um, you need to look for existing code. Um, you need to collaborate with other people. If there is already someone working on something that serves your ID, see if you can't work together. It will be a lot better in the end because you have more people looking at the same code, you have more feedback. You, if someone falls sick or just wants to quit, then at least the software ju just doesn't die out. So try and find existing code. Also, try and find libraries. It doesn't have to be the whole thing. If you're building something that relies on currency, then by all means, put something in your composer JSON file that says, we're using the currency library from commerce, for instance, and then you don't have to write that code yourself. Um, so how do you get started? Well, first of all, by, uh, with writing your foundation, you need to have the full puzzle in mind, but you need to start piece by piece, and I cannot stress this enough. You need to have your full ID in mind, but you need to realize that you can't just write the whole thing in one go. It's going to take a lot of effort. So what you want to do is you want to build, according to the solid principle, small single responsibility pieces that fit well in, into this whole puzzle. And you start with the uh, core business ASAP, so the, the central pieces of your puzzle, you start with those. And then as you get more pieces, people will start to get a picture of what the full puzzle will look like. And the, ed the edge pieces are the nice to have, but you should have your MVP with just the core business. And you really need to go slow. And then um, you always work API first. An example of that is form submissions. You may remember from Drupal 7, that people used to have all of their business logic in the form submit handler. And that's really annoying to work with for other people. Because let's say you have a form that builds a profile and all of the logic goes into that submission handler and then someone wants to write a Drush command that also builds a profile, how are they going to do this? Because all of your business logic is in that submit handler. So now they have to copy paste that. And that's just, you know, shit, no offense. <laughs> it's just, you don't want that. So what you want to do is you want to create a service and that service creates that profile for you. And then in your submit handler, all you do is you gather the, the data from that form and you pass it onto that service. So now, if someone inspects your form where profiles are created, they can see, oh, hey, there's this service where I just need to pass a piece of data and a profile is created. Great, I can call that service. So that's reusable code. That's something you should always keep in, back, in, in the back of your head. And if you write API first, you won't fall into that trap. Because you'll think about this, you'll think about, okay, so now I need something that creates profiles. Okay, I'm gonna create that service. And then when your UI comes later, you already have all of the pieces in place. It becomes really easy to write pages and forms when you build API first. And if your code, if your UI dictates your, your code, you lose. So that's another trap you can fall into. Let's say you have this function called update profile. And in that function, you accept a few arguments, first name, last name, and perhaps job title. That's bad, because now your UI dictates your API. You have a couple of fields on that form, and you can see that in the code. That's really bad, because what happens is, if someone else comes along and writes that Drush command, they're gonna be using your code. But if later on you update your form to ask for an address, then they need to update your code too, because you're gonna change that function signature, which is horrible. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna create perhaps a value object that stores that profile. And then you just pass that value object and the signature of that function will never have to change. And then uh, finally, you write tests from the very first line of code. This is something that I did wrong with group for Drupal 7. I was like, I need to go fast, I need to go awesome. And then I never wrote any tests and I kept breaking my own stuff all the time. Um, nowadays, if you put something on Drupal.org, it's almost expected that you write tests. It's something that I just have to mention. We're not going to be talking about tests right now, um, but you need to test everything. An example in group is that when I, I have this plugin with a couple of flags that you can set, and there's maybe, like, you know how when you have flags, it's going exponential. So first it's like you have true or false, that's two options. You add a second flag, you have four options, then you have eight, 16, et cetera. 
Well, in this plugin, I have 16 flags or something, so it goes into the thousands. What you do is, or what you tend to have, is that, let's say, 50 scenarios are realistic. People tend to write tests for those 50 scenarios. What I did was I wrote a data provider that combines all of the possible things. And then it's OK if tens of thousands of your cases expect a computer to just say, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. That's fine. But you want to have those tests just so that it catches it when someone does come with that edge case scenario. People are going to come with those edge case scenarios, and you're going to get blindsided. So write your tests thoroughly, and you'll be fine. I'm also not going to be talking about the solid principle in detail, because that's part of writing codes, and that's not what this talk is about. But it's implied by those puzzle pieces. If you follow the solid principle, the S for single responsibility, then you're going to end up with puzzle pieces that fit nicely. So let's say you've made it. You've built some software. You've got your core. And now what? So there's light at the end of the tunnel. Well, I can tell you one thing. There's going to be a train coming right at you, barreling down the end of that tunnel, because you'll face so many surprises, and they're all going to catch you off guard. But that's just life, and you'll have to deal with those. But one of the best, advice that I, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is to follow your issue queue. People will pick up your software. There's Google, they will find it, and then they will try it. And then you will have instant feedback. You will, based on how they describe their problems, you will know whether they understand the core ID behind your software. If, based on what they're writing, you're like, oof, these people aren't using my software correctly, or they don't seem to understand where I was trying to go, that's solid feedback. That's telling you that your software isn't in the shape yet that it should be in. Um, and you know you, you should look for that valuable feedback, but importantly, you do not want to give into it too early. This is an another mistake I made with Group for Drupal 7. Um, I was so enthusiastic about writing an alternative to organic groups that people started using Group for all sorts of things. And they were like, yeah, but I'm trying to do it this way, but it doesn't work yet. And I'll, I was always, the answer was like, I'll write it for you. Yeah, so what ended up happening is that Group 7 got bloated with a lot of stuff that I ended up having to maintain, which is a nightmare. Because then people would get upset when you make another change and it breaks their use case, and you just don't want to do that. Stick to your core ID. And then uh, you want to encourage people to write extensions and write them yourself. And this is the important bit. So if your software is well written, then if people come to you with one of these crazy IDs, it allows them to actually carry it out themselves. If they don't know how to write code, they can hire someone who does, and they should be able to write it. And the best way to make sure that they are able to is if you are able to. So what you do is, for instance, with group, I've written, uh, we were sponsored to write the subgroup module. There is nothing that I, that I can do in subgroup that someone else can't do in their module. Why? Because I'm, I'm approaching the group module from the outside. What I do in my module, you can do too. And that is a perfect way to go about it, because then I it means, uh, instantly realized the limitations of the group module. I was like, oh, shit, I'm trying to do this, and it's actually not possible, or it's really hard. And that made me improve group, and to the benefit of everyone else who was trying to write software for it. Um, and this is where it gets a bit more interesting. So, so far, I've been, in my opinion, kicking in some open doors. Uh, but you need to keep in mind that you're nothing special. And if you're a football fan, you might know this song. Um, it's like, you're nothing special, we lose every week. I'm a fan of a Belgian team who lose every week, so I'm very familiar with that song. Um, and so, yeah, but let's get interesting. So what do I mean by you're nothing special? So you want to avoid privileged code. Privileged code is where your code knows about itself, and it does something that someone else can't because they can't possibly know about it. So uh, more on this in my example later. There will be an example with a whole story. But the way you interact with your own code should reflect how other people uh, are able to interact with your own code. And there is a very good example of this. And you all know it. Nodes. In Drupal 6, earlier days, the content in Drupal, that was a privileged something. If you wanted to have something alike or akin to nodes, entities, basically, content entities, you couldn't. And even in Drupal 7, we still had nodes as this special thing. And Entity API was this country module. And we were going in the right direction. But it's, it's nothing compared to what we have in Drupal 10 nowadays. 
And that is awful. It was awful. It was a nightmare to work with nodes in earlier, uh, so, sorry, with custom entities in earlier Drupal versions because of that. Drupal was basically saying, I know there are nodes, and I'm going to write my code around it with the expectation that there are nodes. And nowadays, it's written that, you know, I know there are entities, and I'm going to write my code around it. And it doesn't matter if it's a node, if it's a commerce product, if it's a group, if it's anything, it doesn't matter. We're going to all treat them like equals. And that's where you want to go. Um, so internal is fine to use. Um, basically, you can have some code that you really need to know about, but only for the foundation. Your outer layers of your code should have zero privilege. So basically, consider this like an onion. If people can only interact with the outer uh, part of your onion, and they want to do something that your API, your, your, your exposing on the outer layer, doesn't allow for, they need to do something deep down, yeah, they're stuck. So what then? They're just going to look for another onion. That's it. But if you expose your API on the core of your onion, and then you build the layers around it yourself using that API, then people can actually look into your code and build other layers. They can peel back one of these layers and go like, OK, so how did he do this? Oh, I see. OK, so let's just remove this piece, put my own piece in there, and I still have a functioning onion. So that's what you want to do. Um, so essentially, what you call that in software industry, like two decades ago, I think, it was the mantra of eat your own dog food. You might recognize that from, I think they mentioned that in that Facebook movie or something. But you, you, you want to just, if you build something for other people to use, you want to land in a spot where you use it yourself. That's the best way forward. Um, one sec. So lead by example. And then this is a big one. This is something that I'm also really proud of, um, where I ended up with this. But abstract what you need, but don't sell. Let's talk about group again. What does group sell? What is the ID that I'm selling? I'm selling the ID that you can put users inside of groups as members, and you put content inside of it, and then they can do stuff with that content. It has an access layer so that you could perhaps have private or public content. That's fine. But the core idea is that you put stuff inside of a group, whether that's users, content, config, doesn't matter. That's the core idea. Um, but I needed extra stuff to make that happen. I needed to write an access layer. And that access layer later turned out to become the flexible permissions module. Um, why did it become a module? Well, I realized that in order to give access to a group, I need a permission system. Where do we have that also? In core. I ended up copying a lot of code. And then I realized, hey, I actually want to go further with this. Core doesn't allow you to alter someone's permissions. I wanted something like that. And that's where I stopped. Because at that point, I was realizing I'm going to be writing something that looks like a clone to core plus extras. Is that a great idea? Does that belong in group? Is that the idea that I'm selling? A permission layer, a permission system? No, that's not the idea I'm selling. So what do I do? Well, I turn that into a separate piece of software with a good API, and group just uses that. And that's exactly what happens. But now I had this other issue where if you want to calculate someone's permissions once and then just always return them during runtime from a cache, I'm going to need a cache that can represent various scenarios, whether you're a different user, a different time zone, a different whatever. Um, and those can be dealt with by cache context. So I needed a cache that can work with cache context. The only one in core that we know is render cache. So I ended up going on this crazy coding binge, and I completely rewrote the render cache. Um, and that became the variation cache module. And fate would have it that, based on some feedback in Amsterdam when I was presenting this, someone said, why don't you turn that into a separate module also? And I did. And since a month or two ago, it ended up in core. So now the whole render cache is written by, well, not written by me, but it runs on something that's written by me. The ID wasn't mine. It already existed in the render cache. But I just abstracted it into something that everyone can use. It's not baked into the render cache anymore. So the dynamic page cache also uses it. Group uses it. And it's now just part of core. Anyone can use it. So coming from the group module, we now have a new caching core. 
That's the benefit of writing software like this. You abstract what you, don't, what you need, but you don't sell. And then you, you know, show this to other people. And then if, if it's a good idea, then people might go, hey, you know, let's just give this to everyone. Let's put it in core. And currently, I won this pitch in Pitchburg, like last minute, because initially I was like the first loser, so to speak. And then WordPress came in and funded something. And then I was like the last winner. Um, so, and that is about putting flexible permissions into core. So it's cool, because when variation cache landed in core, I could drop like 30 classes. And then when flexible permissions might land in the core, I can drop another like 30 or 40 classes. And group becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, up until a point where a group might one day, hopefully, become just a recipe, where you have all of these things that are either standalone modules or part of core, and group just ties them together. And if you want to do something similar to group, you should be able to do that with perhaps 20, 30 classes. It doesn't have to be this large as it has always been. So this is one of the new things um, that I want to try, um, is story time. I'm going to tell a story about how Drupal, uh, Group 7, or a group for Drupal 7, evolved like one aspect to Group Drupal 8. Hopefully, I won't run out of time. I've never done this. And it's basically a bit scripted and a bit not scripted. And I'm just going to yap my mouth like I always do. So bear with me. But, um, and I need to drink because I have a dry throat. But essentially, in Drupal 7, I had this notion of memberships, and I still do. And these memberships were in a separate database table. And then when you put content into a group, that was also a separate table for all of the content that you could put, in, put into a group. Why? That's two different tables. So when I joined Decent with the goal to um, upgrade group to Drupal 8 in 2015, I was in this little dusty back room at the decent office in Canterbury. And I was talking to this guy called John Enyu, and he was challenging me. And he was saying, why do you still have two different databases for this? Because you have a lot of code that is similar. If you want to add a member to a group or you want to add a piece of content to a group, it's 90% similar. I was like, yeah, but members are special. Um, you know, They define what your access to a group is. And he was like, yeah, sure, they can still be special. But streamline it. Make it similar to the pieces or the aspects that are similar, and then still have your permission stuff on the side. So we landed on this new entity type, back then called group content. Nowadays, it's called group relationship. And that ties your entities to a group. And whether that entity is a user for being a member or a node for being a piece of content in that group, that doesn't matter anymore. And I was able to drop so much code just by doing that. But then I realized, how do I know, you know what my memberships are. Um, there needs to be some identifier. So we came up with this plugin system that allows you to define how content can be added to a group. Cool. But now I started hating myself again, because I was privileged once again. I knew that if I, if I let my code know about the fact that there is this plugin called memberships, and that always needs to be on, then how are other people going to do this? So I updated my plugins to have this flag, one of the many flags, that says, you know, this always needs to be on. So now I rewrote the code so that it follows that plugin flag. And now other people can also say, hey, I have this plugin that allows you to put stuff in groups, and it needs to be on, on all groups, on all group types at all time. Cool. But I still have a way to figure out, you know, these are members, and this is other stuff. And that's not cool. So I started thinking, why do I need to know why someone is a member, because of the permissions. Because of the permissions that are assigned to that member. They have roles, group roles, assigned to them, and that defines their access. OK, so how do I get rid of that? Because that's privileged. How do I get rid of that? And then we wrote the whole flexible permissions module in later life. But at first, it was like permission calculators. And basically, what it did was it allowed you to write small services that adds permissions to this large amount of calculated permissions. And one of these services turned out to be that we would take a field called group roles from your membership, and we would look into which roles you had, which permissions were tied to them, and we would add that to your batch of calculated permissions. Um, and we have some other systems too, but that was basically the one that I was most concerned about. Now, the cool thing is that with that permission calculating service that we now have, you can turn it off because it's a service. So it's no longer that I hard code the fact that there is going to be a group membership. And that group membership is going to have a group roles field. 
that's going to dictate what your permissions are. No, that's my implementation. Now, it's an outer layer of my onion. Now, people can say, I don't want to work with group roles. I want to have my permissions come from Active Directory, for instance, something external. They can do that. They can just remove the service using uh, the service provider thingy where you alter or remove services. Um, they can just remove my service. And then if you click around in the UI, unless they remove that part, you will still see group roles and stuff, and you can still attach them, but they won't do anything. And that's also the idea that I'm currently selling for core, that you can just basically um, delete user one that way or whatever. But they can do that. So now, group can work with Active Directory. Group can turn certain aspects off. Doesn't matter. The code won't break because it's all part of an API, and my implementation is just an implementation. And the core of group has no expectations whatsoever. So that's how we got to that part. And then the only thing that was still privileged was basically the Boolean ID of, are you a member or not? I still had code that had to figure out whether you're a member or not. So what I have currently is this service called Membership Loader, so that you can swap out that service too. Basically, you give it an account, and it loads the memberships for a particular group or all groups or whatever. You can do that. But I'm going to move away from that idea. And there's a good reason. And this is another lesson that I want to uh, give you. Sometimes you have to move back or, or edge back towards a more privileged approach, sometimes, because group seven was slow. Don't get me wrong. It was really slow on the database. And for group eight, I wanted to have a system where the queries were faster, because some people have websites with hundreds of thousands of groups, hundreds of thousands of users. And if we had some of those queries where we were checking their permissions in all of these groups just to see whether they can see a single node in a list of nodes, you should have seen those queries. Um, I, I could have probably crashed Amazon Web Services with it. It was insane. Um, so I wanted to get rid of that. So I needed some joins. I needed something that was faster. And one of these things was that I needed to put back into the database whether you remember or not. So I did that. And I'm going to actually move away from this membership loader for a while because um, if we have a service that you can use to say whether someone is a member or not, but then the access checks on the database for lists of nodes, lists of groups, or whatever don't respect that, then why do we even have that service? So it doesn't make sense right now. I am thinking in the future of returning to a place where the question, are you a member or not, is something that anyone else can interact with. But then I need to first find a way to load that information into the database. And I'm currently not there yet, so I'm going to move to more privileged codes, take one step back, so I can take two steps forwards afterwards. And that's something you'll sometimes have to do. The morale of this story is that we came from group for Drupal 7, where we had something very simple, a database, um, which, uh, a database table which represented members and a database table which rep represented other content in a group, which was impossible to interact with. There was hardly anything you can do with that. Nowadays, we have the system where you can basically do anything. Don't like group roles? Turn them off. Um, want to wanna get permissions from Active Directory? Sure, go ahead. Um, there is so much you can do right now. And if I do, like, want to add a member to a group, yeah, that's the same method call that you would use to add a node to a group. All of this is streamlined now. And that's what, uh, what I want you guys, or you people, to um, move towards when you write large-scale software. When you write large-scale software in the architectural um, design, think about you know, abstracting what you need but don't sell. Think about the responsibilities of your puzzle pieces. Follow the solid principles. Write tests. Those are open doors I'm kicking in. But essentially, be your own user. Eat your own dog food. That's the lesson I wanted to give to you today. I don't know how much time I have left. I think I should have filled 40 minutes. I don't know how much time we have spent. 30, so that's perfect. Leaves 10 minutes for questions. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any question about what I just said, or just you know, if you're building large-scale software and you're stuck, or you want to get a suggestion or whatever, just fire away. There's probably a microphone. Here's one. Um, so first of all, yeah, obviously, uh, thank you for listening. There's this microphone. I'm going to drink again because I am seriously bothered by this dry throat. But anyone, feel free, shoot. <laughs> what
was this was this interesting? Okay. That's like, this, because I was trying something new with more of a story instead of like many slides that show code and everything, I was a bit worried, but I'm, I'm hoping it was interesting. These are like actual lessons that I learned from writing group. When I was writing group from, for Drupal 7, I made so many mistakes that I hated myself for, and I'm probably still making mistakes today that I will hate myself for a year from now, but I'm making them more carefully now. I'm taking my time and I only add a new piece to group when I'm convinced that it should add value. And I might make a mistake still, but I'm going so slow that you know, you'll only ever make one big mistake a year or something at most because I'm going so slow. Going slow is actually going fast when it comes to writing large-scale software. Sometimes I spend a full week just thinking. I write zero code. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it like this, and I keep this whole puzzle in my head so I don't sleep that week. It ruins my sleep. I keep this whole puzzle in my head, and then it just clicks one day. You have this idea, and then a day later, you shoot it down because you realize, oh, but that's going to interact poorly with that system or whatever. And then one day, you're like, oh, shit, this is going to work. And then you get really excited, and then you start writing the code, and it takes only a couple hours to get it to work because it's all in your head. Um, and that's a really cool feeling, and I'm hoping that by, you know, joining me for this talk and by experimenting with it yourself that you might too get that feeling because it's an amazing feeling. So yeah, I just wanted to share that. And now hopefully someone has some questions. If not, also cool. So thank, thank you for the, uh, for the talk. It, it was great. Uh, oh, so there, yeah, okay. So, um, <laughs> half blind. I just not really. But. To, to ask about, you mentioned uh, that there was this uh, cache part that you uh, ended up in Drupal core, mm -hmm. and it was organic because you first like uh, created uh, internally, then you moved it into a contributed module, and finally that contributed model ended up like some part getting into core. So uh, looking it backwards from now, uh, would you do it differently? Like, would you try to add directly if you see something like really specialized that may be added to core, try to add it directly to core instead of having all these process and why? No, no. So that's a very good question, and the answer is no, because core moves really slowly. Sorry for core maintainers in the room. It moves really slowly, and I think they're right to have it move that slowly. Um, you don't just rewrite a cache in core and expect people to review that patch and accept it. It's thousands of lines of code. It's got so many implications. Uh, many things can go wrong. So the best advice that I can give you there is do write it as an external system. Put it on Drupal.org as a module and make your code rely on that module. Can be a pain in the ass because if you do that during an upgrade and people upgrade first without installing the new dependency first and they get like missing service stuff and whatever and can be a pain in the ass, so be warned. And I actually shot myself in the foot massively um, by having variation cache accepted into core because now I need to write a version of variation cache that aliases the classes in core. When they are there and when they're not there, it aliases the original. So yeah, it's going to be a pain in the ass to get that transition period uh, between now and Drupal 10.2 where it's going to be available for everyone. Um, but I still think it's the best way forward. Put it somewhere first because what I could do now was I updated that issue sometimes, and I hate it when people bump stuff, but I did it myself. I basically said, hey, it's been a couple months. Don't want to pressure you, but I currently have 10,000 people running this, and there are zero bug reports. And then I left it for a while. And that's the cool thing about API modules. You hardly get any bug reports because either it works or it doesn't, or people don't really figure out what's wrong. Um, yeah, that happens too, obviously, when it's too complicated and people are just like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and then a couple months later, I was like, okay, we're now at 14,000 installs, zero bug reports. Um, and then during that pitch that I had at Pitchburg, that was part of my slides, part of my you know, pitch, I said I've written variation cache. It's running for a year or two now. This many installs, zero bug reports. I've written flexible permissions more recently, 2,000 installs, zero bug reports. Um, and it's, it's more convincing that way. And because they're APIs, you don't have a UI that can mess thing up, things up, that can have people try to alter it, et cetera. It just does its job. It's like a single responsibility thing. Um, so it's easy to get to a situation where you have thousands of installs and zero bug reports. 
big pipe was the same thing. Wim was always proud of that one. Like, hey, I have big pipe, you know, zero bug reports, and I can tell Wim I have two modules with zero bug reports. So beat that. Um, so yeah, that's where you want to head. Basically separate it out into a, into a different module and go nuts, and then have an issuing core where you convert that module into the core namespaces, and then, you know, slowly go at it. If a test goes red, make it go green. If people have feedback, adjust your code to that feedback, and eventually it will land if it's useful enough. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks for raising your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Otherwise, I would be going like, where is he? So, I, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, the question was about documentation. Um, did documentation feature in your thoughts in this process? It should have. <laughs> but I hate paperwork. So, yeah, documentation is important. So, there are many ways to document something. What I tend to do is because I'm really like, deep into write, write, I love writing complex code. So I realize that not everyone will immediately understand what's going on, so I document my code really well. My inline comments really explain what's happening. If you look at the code behind the variation cache, there's this uh, concept called cache redirects, which blew me off my feet the first time I saw it. It's like a really complex concept, so I thought, I think it was Sasha Grossum, Gross, Groschenberg, I, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but either way, Birder who first introduced it to me way back when in an issue, and I was like, wait, cache redirects, come again, what's that? Um, but then I went and investigated what they are like, uh, what, they, what their purpose is, and I obviously had to write them myself. So I wrote a new system for these cache redirects once I mastered the concept. And because I realized that it's a difficult concept, I have like 30, 40 lines of comments above the key parts in that um, variation cache that does that magic, just explaining what's going on in there. Um, do I have documentation on Drupal.org? Not as much as I would like. I am, like everyone here, limited by the time I have available. It's a cop-out, I know. Um, but I, I have had this other talk at DrupalCon 2020 where I said, you know, sometimes people need to sponsor us. Sometimes we don't have the time. Sometimes if you want to get something better, like if you want to get another sub-module for a group or if you want to get a new service or whatever, if it's not on my radar, you need to sponsor that or you need to do it yourself. Um, and luckily, I've had a few people who actually stepped up and started writing documentation for a group, and I'm really thankful to those people. Um, but you can't do everything yourself, and at one point, I do have to make choices, and I really, really, really hate paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about what you said about the code knowing about itself, and maybe there's one level that's not so obvious, but the code node that is Drupal. Have you thought about abstracting something outside of Drupal and making it library? Yes, I have, and I couldn't. Because um, if you look at the structure of dependencies, variation cache relies on the cache in Drupal core. It's basically sugar on top of a regular cache. And then flexible permissions relies on that. Flexible permissions could be a library that could benefit so many open source projects but, cache. but it relies on that caching system. So um, I don't know if you know, but cache contexts are actually something sort of unique to Drupal, and they're really cool. Um, yeah, I know, and other libraries would really benefit from that, too. Yes, exactly. So they would really benefit from that concept. But because it was baked in the render cache, we couldn't. So what we could do is we could take variation cache at first and put that into a library and basically come up with an interface that says, this is how this needs to interact with your cache. And then implements a sort of like glue layer or a bridge layer that implements that with your cache so that it can be a separate um, library. It that would go to Symfony, for example. Yeah, exactly. So it would really fit into the Symfony ecosystem really well. And then if we have that, then we could have flexible permissions moved over because it doesn't know about entities or anything whatsoever. All it knows is about Symfony services that declare themselves as uh, calculators and that it needs a variation cache. So yes, I have thought about this, but the easiest path forward right now is to get it into core, because it's a really hard sell to tell core that you're going to be writing a new library outside of the system, and that they are going to have to depend on it. It's probably possible, but that was like something, like new ground for me. And I thought, I really want to get this into core. There is one process that I know will work, 
you know, write a patch, write a merge request, follow up on it, convince people that it's useful, and it will someday hopefully land. Um, but I am still convinced that what I've written with variation cache and flexible permissions is so awesome for other software that it should ideally um, be part of, you know, a larger ecosystem, Symfony, for instance. Yep. Now, but now that it's in core, do you think there are still some paths that lead to this uh, outcome? Maybe, but that's not up for me to decide because it's a whole other thing. Uh, like, it's hard to get something into core, but get, getting something out of core, that's going to be even harder. So uh, I'm signing off at this point. Okay. I, I've done my job, in my opinion, and while I do feel that these pieces of software could serve for the wider community, um, I'm not going to occupy myself with that right now. I understand. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, then I would really like to thank you for your attention and the good questions, and I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>